Welcome to another News. I'm Jeff Brady. I was fortunate to be a guest on the Cosmic Switchboard hosted by James Bartley, and the topic was to provide some scaffolding to answer the question, is an alien race terraforming the Earth under the pretense of an unauthorized geoengineering operation? Now, Loosely defining terraforming would be intentionally modifying the atmosphere, its volatile components, temperature, surface topography or ecology to match a suitable habitat, and I would add also modifying conditions for other operations such as temporary occupation, genetic harvesting, or underground operations such as mining. As many of you know, climate engineering and its chemical fallout is one of the most wicked agendas imposed onto the environment and humanity. These operations are so deceptive and diabolical, many protect themselves from learning more and remain in disbelief while aggressive, real-time climate engineering is deployed night and day in plain sight. However, Sinister operations at this magnitude couldn't happen without a network of compliant people behind the scenes. The backdrop people from the so-called environmental groups, Pentagon generals, propaganda media, NASA scientists, university professors to TV meteorologists, and some of them we've now understood through the work of geoengineeringwatch.org, are under gag orders. But I'm suspicious about the people under gag orders, and if they're real people. How could humans sell out their own ecosystem and life support in such lockstep? Something isn't right there either. For several years, I worked with anti-geoengineering people, good people who were making a difference and bringing awareness to the aerosol operations. In the early summer of 2014, we gathered at an organizer's home to make some food and catch up. That evening, we're quietly talking in a few groups while looking across Long Island Sound. These were lawyers, teachers, engineers, and I remember how we quietly affirmed to one another that there must be some type of alien, non-human involvement with the ubiquitous aerosol operations. How can it be deployed worldwide all the time in secret? How? That night, I left thinking about the time we all spend in countering the climate change propaganda and bringing awareness to real-time climate engineering and how these operations actually create climate disruption inadvertently or intentionally. As everyone knows at this point, the climate change narrative is used to heavily propagandize populations into the current restrictions being imposed right now, including the elimination of farmers. So you have this double gatekeeping. You have the barrier of state propaganda, but you also have the alien non-human involvement behind the mask of the climate change narrative. It's a topic and concept generally kept quiet because if you're bringing awareness to the diabolical aerosol operation of climate engineering and you also bring aliens into the mix... You've created an avenue for attack and discrediting and potentially reversing any gains made in fortifying the public with substantial information. That being said, I'm presenting some ideas to prop up this scaffolding as an organized hypothesis and food for thought. It's important to also point out about how saturated the public domain had become several years ago with citizen journalists dispersing quality research and evidence visually and through documentation about ongoing real-time climate engineering. I want to mention the work of several anti-geoengineering activists who have passed on and had dedicated parts of their life and resources into exposing the climate engineers and its fallout They are Bridget Conroy of Arizona Skywatch, Rosalind Peterson of California Skywatch, Dr. Mike Castle, Michael Murphy, Gwen Scott, author Jerry Smith, and Dr. Ilya Sandra Perlingeri. There are many more, and the appreciation of their work lives on. In my opinion, the citizen journalist-style research was so effective A massive disinformation campaign was launched as a countermeasure. 
listeners may recall, for several years between 2009 and maybe around 2015, Gatekeeper Outlets published articles estimated in the hundreds about climate engineering, playing semantics, or outright denying real-time use of weather control technology while claiming to be researching it as a contingency to counter climate change. As this aggressive real-time climate engineering continues altering what we perceive to be natural weather worldwide, it also facilitates disaster capitalism models. Part of the reason there's so much deception and bitter contention swirling around this topic is because this is a multi-layered terraforming operation. A terraforming that includes the deploying of micro-millimeter radiation frequency, such as the current 4 and 5G that interferes with the Schumann resonance. That's the natural frequency of the planet sandwiched between the Earth's surface and the atmosphere. The Schumann resonance is also known to perfectly match the human brain frequency. Here we have man-made radiation being used to scatter and remove the human brain's natural connection to this resonant earth space. Many have asked, how is it possible for a worldwide operation of spraying particulates into the lower atmosphere allowed to continue in plain sight, upheld by a tired, worn-out lie when anyone can witness the activity overhead? Well, doesn't it seem like something here is beyond the control of the current power structure? It's clear that one way to cause a smokescreen is a campaign of constant cognitive dissonance. The well-funded lies surrounding the topics of climate change and climate engineering are the reason why the topic has been revisited for the last decade on this show in other news. Video evidence of climate engineering aerosol operations being conducted in the United States, Canada, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and many other countries have been witnessed by millions of people. However, there's an attitude of willful ignorance among climate scientists and researchers that needs to be understood on many levels. What's very clever and pernicious here is that the very topic of being environmentally mindful has been hijacked. The reality is anti-geoengineering activists care deeply about the health of the environment. That's why they sound the alarm about the human health and environmental effects of spraying soft metals, such as aluminum, into the atmosphere and using electromagnetic technology to heat and control weather system boundaries and jet streams. The truth is most people have known climate engineering is causing extreme weather and that it's being used to further a false green agenda that has already started to erode human rights and be used to lock in a dystopian surveillance state. It's taking form in the UK and now Canada with illegal laws limiting travel. Again, most articles written about geoengineering in the last eight years and recently in the New York Times will patronize the reader with a circular narrative offered by captured scientists, usually from institutions such as Cornell, Stanford, and Harvard. That circular narrative is more than a decade old. People such as David Keith and other scientists were openly discussing geoengineering as a last resort to mitigate the warming of the climate, using soft metals such as aerosolized aluminum to be a reflective layer in the upper atmosphere. Again, the claims are that these operations are only contingencies and haven't been deployed. David Keith's group is partially funded by the Gates Foundation. Keith repeats the mantra that geoengineering could work if we were to deploy, but we need to be careful, etc. Meanwhile, there's full denial of the ongoing aerosol operations. Here's some text from his site. Quote, We're not now involved in outdoor experimentation, though we are indeed actively developing proposals for field experiments. This experiment will proceed only if it is conducted in a fully transparent and public manner, and only if it passes a comprehensive independent safety review. The experimental plans, operations, and results will be publicly available and freely usable. No patenting. End quote. Well, what would these experiments look like? 
Twelve years ago, David Keith announced at an AAAS meeting in San Diego that the stratospheric aerosol geoengineering proposals will now consider using 10 megatons of aluminum per year. He qualifies that, quote, we haven't done anything serious on aluminum, such as health and environmental impacts, and so there could be something terrible that we find tomorrow that we haven't looked at. Meanwhile, as many know, high levels of aluminum have been showing up in surface water, air samples, and soil tests thousands of times higher than EPA allowable levels. There's no question that large-scale climate engineering is untested and dangerous. We've mostly thought about sulfur, and there's a lot of good reasons to think about sulfur, because sulfur's what uh, uh, nature does, and there are very good reasons to think we'd like to start very slowly if we ever wanted to do this, and do something that was an analog to nature, because we have some idea what the downsides of what nature does are. Nevertheless, there might be some good reasons to think about aluminum. It turns out, first of all, there's been a lot of work on the environmental consequences of aluminum in the stratosphere because it's in shuttle exhausts. There's a bunch of papers companies that look at the radiative and ozone, uh, ozone-destroying properties of aluminum in the stratosphere, and those make you think it might be useful. The big deal, really, is that alumina has four times the volumetric radiative forcing of, for small particles, as does sulfur, and that means you have four times less surface area for the same radiative forcing, and this is a much bigger deal, you have roughly 16 times less the coagulation rate, and that's the thing that really drives removal. So you could get away, we think, with much smaller mass fluxes, but we haven't run those studies yet, so that might be wrong. Um, The little picture is from a nanofabrication study, which shows you can make very high quality, and do this in just a jet in a very simple way, make high quality alumina particles just by spraying alumina vapor out, which oxidizes. So it's certainly in principle possible to do that, there's a big literature that's already looked at that. Look at the alumina or or sulfuric acid um, functions, which are the uh, mass-specific backscatter, so a measure of radiative forcing. In fact, I have it in watts per square meter per megaton. And those things fall off as as the particles get larger. But even more important, the fall speed rises quite rapidly in this regime. And so as particles stick together and get large, they fall out of the stratosphere very quickly. And so particles that are too large are much less effective per unit mass. The Keith Group addresses the chemtrails conspiracy theory by writing, quote, because of the apparent similarities between the proposed implementation methods for albedo modification, such as injecting reflective particles into the stratosphere, and the alleged methods for producing chemtrails. Some people have linked the notion of chemtrails to the study of albedo modification. And it continues, There is no evidence for the existence of chemtrails. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. The claim that there is a large-scale secret program to spray materials from aircraft is extraordinary. Yet all the evidence we have seen to date has been very weak. The most common claim is simply that aircraft contrails look different, without any comparative analysis. This is as convincing as saying that alien beings walk among us in disguise as people, because some people act very strangely. Again, this is on the Keith Group website, and it continues... If there really were a large-scale program dumping material from aircraft at the scale described, there would have to be a large operating program to manufacture, load, and disperse materials. If such a program existed at the scale required to explain the claimed amount of chemtrails, it would require thousands or perhaps tens of thousands of people. It would be extraordinarily hard to keep such a program secret because it would be so easy for a single individual in the program to reveal it using leaked documents, photographs, or actual hardware. Well, this is an interesting summary on the rejection that they're involved in any geoengineering or chemtrail operations as they've defined. Interesting because they've made it clear they're not involved, which could either be a huge lie and massive liability, or they're telling the truth, and there's actually something else going on that they can't discuss. Now, researchers at geoengineeringwatch.org 
sent up a small plane and flew through a trail left by a chemtrail aircraft. They caught the particles in the trail to be tested. Among the soft metals were nanoparticles such as graphene oxide, the same component put into the so-called vaccines. When honestly evaluated, the experimental gene therapy shot was forced onto the population from a corrupt power tracking back to the Gates Foundation and the cult known as the WEF. You may have seen those space-age robes some of the members of the WEF have worn. You may remember John Kerry recently saying, and I think it was at the Davos event this year in 2023, quote, I mean, it's so almost extraterrestrial to think about, quote, saving the planet. To this day, real-time climate engineering remains the most secretive topic worldwide. No elected politician in the United States has directly responded to implicit questions about real-time climate engineering operations conducted in the lower atmosphere that millions are witnessing. None. How can that be? Yes, again, we've heard that NOAA and related government agency contractors are known to be under gag order. They can't speak about the massive ongoing climate engineering, but I suspect this is more related to an alien terraforming agenda. Like many sky watchers, I've caught UFOs on video flying near or in the same direction as the spray planes, and also video of UFOs flying right at the planes. I use the word planes lightly because it's been shown for years that these aircraft glitch out and take the forms of round glowing shapes or wingless tubes. They can appear transparent and I've caught one on video taking the form of a disc. They're morphing in shape all while spraying. The lower atmosphere is continually sprayed with soft metals and nanoparticulates by non-conventional aircraft. That right there is a huge existential threat. The lower atmosphere is continually sprayed with soft metals and nanoparticulates by non-conventional aircraft. Another significant factor often overlooked is the speed of the aircraft that are releasing persistent aerosol trails. The aircraft can at times appear to travel far beyond the standard passenger jet speed of around 550 miles per hour. Most people have a general idea of that speed when watching a jet at cruising altitude. However, the ones laying down the aerosol trails often move at double or triple that speed. They will also travel in pairs, in threes, and at times caught on video in attack formations. They will also travel in single file, laying down trails within trails. Some of these aircraft spraying within the trails are smaller, maybe adding a different chemical to the first trail. When you watch these aircraft through binoculars over hours at a time, you may see them appearing out of nowhere. This could be, of course, from turning on the spraying devices and suddenly appearing visible, but keep in mind these aircraft can become invisible. I've caught it on video. If you have the time and can stomach it, watch the operations carefully through a high-powered lens. I was also told that the speed of the aircraft was significant to a certain dispersal pattern and certain particulate aerosol. The wild speed of these aircraft is a significant factor. It doesn't mean they're of alien origin, but this anomaly adds to the non-conventionality of the aerosol aircraft. It's also known that technology exists to conceal the aircraft's visibility in the sky, and this could be causing distortions. If there is some type of technology concealing an unconventional spacecraft to make it appear conventional, then you may see distortions as the object is moving away from you because the light reflecting back from the false image will take longer to absorb into the camera sensor, allowing it to pick up anomalies. That time delay is valuable for revealing fake aircraft on video. 
Then you look at the cost of keeping tens of thousands or more aircraft in the sky, releasing aerosolized soft metals constantly now for at least 20 years worldwide. And again, these operations have been documented in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the United States, Europe, and the UK region. Are they spraying heavily in other regions, such as South and Central America, China, and Russia? To touch back on the UFOs and other anomalies caught on video amid the aircraft involved in climate engineering, I had interviewed an Italian skywatcher and geoengineering researcher known as Tanker Enemy in July of 2010. He has caught so many serious anomalies above Italy, it's incredible. This was a print interview translated from Italian. And Tanker Enemy writes, Aircraft engaged in clandestine aerosol operations are always without identifying brands and are invisible to civilian radar, too. And jumping in here for a minute, the, this lack of transponder data is echoed in an interview with Andrew Johnson on In Other News. Andrew lives in the UK and used a tracking program to capture transponder data from aircraft flying over his home. And ultimately, he concluded the aircraft that were releasing the persistent trails that spread out into cloud cover did not send out the required transponder data. And so I asked Tanker Enemy, do you suspect aliens are involved in these spraying projects? Is it a terraforming project? Now again, this is July 2010. He writes, maybe, and this is translated from Italian to English, maybe we should think to interdimensional creatures than aliens. The terraforming seems to be implemented to make the environment suitable for living beings whose DNA is based on silicon rather than carbon. It is possible to establish the following scenario. Hostile beings are allies of the armies and world governments. They're being combated, even if ineffectually and in a sporadic way, by forces who want to safeguard the planet. And he refers me to these orbs of light that are often observed or disturbed by what he calls the chemical flights, the chemtrails. Okay, as mentioned earlier about anomalies and UFOs charging at the planes, maybe these are indigenous atmospheric entities resisting the terraforming. I ask him, you are among a few who have filmed very strange activity. What is the strangest thing you've seen in the sky? And he refers me to a video in where you can see a Boeing 757 entering a cloud and then disappearing inside of it. And in those moments, you can discern these balls of light coming out of the cloud while the aircraft disappears. Why would numerous anomalies like this occur if this was about spraying reflective particles to cool the rising temperatures using conventional planes? Something else very big has been going on right above us, and we've turned away. As mentioned, recent analysis of an air sample taken from within a chemtrail by Geoengineering Watch include nanoparticles along with the familiar range of soft metals such as barium, strontium, and aluminum. A scientist named J. Marvin Herndon concluded in an interview here on In Other News that the full spectrum analysis of what's falling out of the sky is analogous to coal fly ash. Coal fly ash is the industrial waste from coal-fired power plants. The ash is collected into scrubbers, the filtration systems within the coal factory smokestacks. It's very expensive to dispose of and sequester. Also in the past, researchers analyzed the fallout content that include a range of viruses, desiccated blood cells. Ultimately, this is a vector to essentially wipe out or debilitate any specific species on the ground. There's also the Mergellans issue related to that. Quote, Our biology is being negatively affected by this intrusion into our lives. Clifford Carnicom, a researcher into this topic, warns, quote, Whether it will be 15 or 50 years from now. 
It seems likely to many that a terraforming operation is also occurring within the human body, as in preparing the human body to be a host for an entity or tracking technology. Many have been discussing this serious issue for years. It's been happening very slowly, but as we've seen, the more people wake up, the quicker the agenda accelerates. About a decade ago, there was a site called Data Asylum. The site addressed the aerosol operations in the context of film references and also something called BioAPI. That is their name for the type of nanotech in the particulates that we all breathe in. It's embedded in our tissues and wires the body to be tracked and influenced remotely. The site lists some of the 101 reasons for the operations, including blocking the sun, and they write, quote, This is a standard reason given to fools in the government. We need to secretly stop global warming, so keep it a secret that we're spraying. If you're smarter than this, then they'll give you a better reason which is a reduction in sunlight across the planet works well to decrease or manipulate crop yields slightly. This is part of the requirement to engineer a food crisis, bring in a famine. He writes, you can dismiss this. The next phase listed is disaster capitalism. Superheating the atmosphere. In order to create earthquakes and steer hurricanes, the atmosphere needs to be more conductive for electricity, so installations such as HARP can work their magic. Health erosion is a side effect. Everyone's health and immune systems become slightly compromised. This is usually not an issue for most healthy people. Older people on average will die sooner, and any health complication is slightly more likely to be fatal. This is both a side effect of spraying and intentional. Nanofiber propagation. To universally install a bio-API in everyone, they need to spray nanofibers. These fibers cannot be put into the food supply or given in some other way. The uptake across the population would take forever and not propagate very effectively. It's much easier just to spray everyone And because it's happening to everyone, the universal herd mentality of the masses justify it. And then the article goes into something called the bio-API phase. There are two phases. If you can imagine a new laptop computer, all it has is an operating system like Windows, so it's useless in a way. This would be equivalent to phase one. So a new computer can be remotely controlled, a.k.a. phase one. And he refers you to a movie titled Surrogates 2009. Uh, So phase one, um, it can be remotely controlled by your IT tech support guy, but that's all. There are no programs installed, but phase two is installing the program. These names of a phase one and two are not necessarily random nonsense I made up. See the clip in movie for Control Factor 2003, in which... They use these exact names in the same exact context because they're telling you everything. And if you listen to the interview with David Case, we reference the movie there, Control Factor, again. So phase one, everyone on the planet is affected and involved in this phase. Everyone, to some extent, has the nanofibers within their body cavity and therefore wired. Side effects include a clicking sound from within the skull and basic annoying body complications like aching joints. Phase 2 must be triggered by nano-trigger bots and it's extreme. It completely compromises your health and can do anything from kill you to monitor you. This phase cannot be forced onto you like phase 1. This involves multiple nanosensors from ocular to heart and everything in between. I figure about 2% of the population has gone through this phase. This is not very pleasant material. Again, that's from the site called Data Asylum that is no longer online. I think they do have a Twitter account. To me, this level of biological interference using nanotech to disrupt and monitor humans is highly suspicious and connected to non-human involvement. In 2003, I produced a documentary titled Climate Engineers. I traveled to Palo Alto to attend an event where 
several scientists spoke about the potential of geoengineering. I spoke with Ken Caldera, a well-known geoengineering expert who told me he and several scientists had a meeting in a room at Lawrence Livermore Labs and tried to come up with ways to use the Earth's natural forces as weapons. He said we could put pathogens in a cloud and have it rain out in an area as big as the former Soviet Union. I used to work at Lawrence Livermore National Lab and I once participated in a meeting where we all sat around the room and thought about how could we manipulate geophysical systems to use it as a weapon. The meeting was about weaponizing geophysical interventions. That means, you know, could you somehow interfere in Earth functioning in a way that you could use it as a military weapon? Could you change climate? Could you, what could you do in terms of manipulating the sort of Earth's physical systems to, as a weapon? Well, you know, some of the ideas were, were, okay, we could, maybe we could blow up hydrogen bombs, you know, underwater, offshore, and make a tidal wave that would go over a city. And, you know, the result was, well, isn't it easier just to drop the hydrogen bombs on the city? You know, that, that there, now you could imagine, though, say, putting pathogens in a cloud, let the cloud, uh, you know, go over somewhere and then would rain down on your enemy and create, you know, do chemical or germ warfare in this kind of way. And that might work against something that would say as big as the former Soviet Union, where, you know, you could be pretty sure that within a few days th that cloud would rain out. I had to stop and think about that. That's a massive area. You could use an aerosol delivery to release pathogens on such a massive area? That's essentially what happened in the film Toxic Skies, starring Anne Hesch. But here is Ken Caldera confirming the weaponization potential of this vector against human populations. Another reason I suspect there's a non-human component to the ubiquitous aerosol operation is that it's more secret than aliens and UFOs. Are the world militaries and related agencies doubling down on a cognitive dissonant psyop by saying they're proposing the very operations millions witness in the sky every day? Or are they telling a form of the truth, meaning, no, we're not doing that, that's some other entities? We can't talk about it, but it's not us, and it's not our stratospheric aerosol operation. I'm not trying to make an airtight case regarding non-human involvement with climate engineering. Again, I suspect there's a non-human involvement in these operations. The aircraft glitch out when caught on video at times. They're spraying this horrible stuff over the majority of the known geographic landmass. There's no bigger project than this to date, and through hundreds of millions poured into propaganda and misinformation campaigns, it's kept out of the public domain still. We can't fathom the magnitude of this project. It's beyond massive. That tells you right there, this is everything to the power structure. If you control the sun, you control the food, if you control the climate and can engineer, quote, natural disasters, you control the population. Can humans be capable of this tyranny, this psychopathy? Of course. But at this magnitude, with this level of discretion and organization, maybe not without the aid of some outside supernatural force. Terraforming being used to offer better access to mining in areas of permafrost and mining in general has been a major focus of many narratives when it relates to alien activity on Earth. Now, we've talked about the anomalies related to the aerosol aircraft glitching out, vanishing, morphing, but a similar anomaly occurs when UFO hunters catch craft flying around abandoned mines and potential underground bases. Listen here to what past guest Jennifer Bryan, a mother of four children living in Toronto, described in her experiences witnessing and recording aircraft reconfiguring their light arrangements to mimic jets. She observed this phenomena during the day, twilight, and dusk. Uh, 
um, I'll look up and I'll just, I I can't describe it. I just know it's one of the fakers. And then I get my camera on it and sure enough, there's bizarre things like no windows, no markings. Um, The day before I was down at the lake and I saw, you know, this drone type jet. It looked like they look, the only way I can describe it is they look kind of like drones. If you know, if you know what drones look like, because I never did, and uh, it flew over me, and then in my mind, I got this kind of feeling or message or whatever you want to call it, uh, that it can change its colors. And so when I looked up, I was uh, down by the beach, I was feeding the ducks with my little one, and uh, this thing, and it, just by the noise too, the whirring noise, um, when it's you know right on top of me, I look, it's, it was like a pearl white. I mean, not only does it look really funny. But it's like a pearl white, and then uh, as it was going, it changed to, you know, the only way I can describe it is like a luminescent sort of uh, greenish blue, a really pale, shiny, you know, bluish green color. And then, you know, within another five seconds, it was like a silvery gray. So in my mind, I, you know, I just got this feeling, wow, they can even change their paint colors in the daytime. Uh, and then it came back around again as if to show me, and it did the same thing, and I felt like it was confirming what I was thinking you know that it just came right over my head and I zoomed in with my camera um, and I did post that on YouTube and uh, it looks bizarre it um, you know the wings are pretty much transparent the middle part of the plane is you can see the blue sky between the middle just doesn't look real they look like ghosts to me is the only way I can describe it you know, maybe they have the technology to cloak themselves and not appear on radar and not, you know, because it's bizarre that they don't appear in snow and rain ever uh, in the three months I've been looking for them in any weather condition. Of course, human planes are out regardless of weather. So it just makes me wonder, I mean, you know, perhaps in this morph that they do that, uh, you know, it has to, they can only be visible on certain weather conditions. I don't know. About 11 years ago, Allison Cruz was on the show. She had captured some of the best UFOs morphing into conventional human-made aircraft at night, complete with the blinking FAA lights. This is in western Pennsylvania. Lots of hills and ridge lines. She was filming those UFOs in this area where there are many abandoned coal mines. The UFOs were mimicking planes. Now, I want to just go back for a minute to the morphing of these objects into domestic aircraft. And a lot of people are calling them fake planes. A past guest, uh, Jennifer O'Brien, was on the show, and she's from Toronto, and she was chronicling that phenomena where she lives. Well, it turns out that uh, you guys actually know each other. Talk about her experience and maybe some similarities of maybe what's going on there with your area. Yeah, I met her through Facebook. And uh, she, when she found out that I was the person in Pennsylvania who she saw my videos, and that's how, you know, it gives, gives you confirmation that you're not nuts for thinking these planes aren't really planes. And uh, why are they silent and why are they going in circles around you and diving into woods, you know, typically, things like that, which um, her area is in, is kind of wooded, I believe, too. I can't remember the details of everybody. There's There's got to be over 500 people now worldwide that I've heard from since 2009 because I was trying to figure out who are they, what are they doing, and why they keep showing back up and pacing over the woods. That's the main thing that they do that gives them the way, is being low and slow, silent, and pacing. They go, they sweep back and forth. So I started investigating, what are they pacing over? And luckily, one of the aerial maps online showed our woods in winter when there was no leaves on the trees, and I could see patterns in the ground. Well, when I ask people who grew up there, you know, what's in this area here? What what are those patterns? They said, oh, there's old coal mines. And the patterns are from the uh, things collapsing, the mine shafts and all that are collapsing. And that's what shows the patterning. And, and then they told me about how there had been a fire, you know, 50 years ago or something in the mine, and they closed it in. They just bulldozed the end of it to try to put the coal mine fire out. And there's a train underneath stuck in the... Um, the mine shaft, 
a whole train is buried in there, stuff like that. And then so I looked around and I noticed that when I went to this one high hill that I could see if the leaves were gone, I could see that all the hills that had the old coal mines were what they would stop over or just show up over. You could see them in night vision arrive, and they still look like a little dot moving. But the majority of people, you know, when they say that they just showed up and they just disappeared, that's probably not what happens because they, they're they still visible out of our visible spectrum. You know, the, the pacing over, I was trying to figure out what technology are they using that they would need to be near these mines or pace back and forth several times. What is going on during that? Because that always happened before they'd flare up and turn into crafts or project a craft or whatever. This expanding size thing for the smaller bubble-like spheres, I think, required some other fuel. And that pacing and that low sphere thing he's whizzing around must be gathering something they need to transform or whatever it is they're doing. I don't know. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it was bothering me not knowing. So I kept trying to figure out, you know, fission, fusion, you know, nuclear power interactions. Uh, Some people have reported high radiation readings after some have been near or sitting on the ground. So uh, obviously that would require, you know, nuclear fission, right? A cold fusion, a, a room temperature fusion, uh, which I now understand does emit a certain amount of radiation, but nothing like the hot fusion. So potentially yeah. there's a, a a nuclear reaction going on at around room temperature. When you see this activity of adaptive camouflage repeatedly, it's now a little easier to digest how a terraforming operation occurs with UFOs disguised as planes, and the double-blind denial of agencies rejecting any involvement. Anyway, this is consistent with what Ellen Crystal wrote in her 1989 book titled Silent Invasion in terms of how aliens will use existing mine structures to access minerals. Who knows, maybe the aliens created the mines to begin with and humans inherited them and then continued to dig them out, or they both utilize the mines. In Chapter 9 of Ellen's book titled Aliens Underground, it reads, and this is near Pine Bush, by the way, it reads, Everything fell into place. Until then, I hadn't figured out why the ships were landing in the same fields and forest areas night after night. The ships were always in the woods, in exactly the same place, month after month, year after year. But we still couldn't get to them. The terrain was too rough. The drilling was in the woods, in the middle of the night, no less. I'd been there with other people, and we'd heard it. But we couldn't find its source. The noise seemed to be everywhere we walked. Now, the reason was clear. It was coming from under us. I said to Dale and her husband, quote, would you tell me what in the hell is going on? And they told me a story about the earth being up for grabs by many extraterrestrial races who have come to claim a stake. Sounds like mining to me. I've received reports from around the country about underground drilling in woods during the night and electrical generators operating in areas where no one is doing construction. And she suspects that there are underground installations being used to house alien aircraft. And she writes, as I have concluded, there must be a large number of such aircraft already there. I think a person would feel the ground rumble when an entrance opens nearby. One hunter told me that he'd felt precisely that on several occasions in a certain section of the forest. And on each occasion, animals fled the area. He took his cue from them and also left. I feel we are closing in on the aliens, and it's only a matter of time before we discover an entrance. The question then is, what will we find? What could they have been doing? I asked myself. I was sure they were drilling and had machinery operating. Dale and Mark told me the aliens were mining beryllium, zirconium, and titanium. I pursued this clue via library research. 
Amazingly, I learned that the three metals were not only rare, but were found only in some small Asian countries, and I nearly flipped out about this. What was going on? When we checked the fields the next day, we saw no evidence of mining. Occasionally, some of the local residents found diggings on their property, diggings large enough to have been made by machinery, but there is no construction authorized by the owners. All the land is privately owned by farmers who plow and plant. Some ground markings were here and there, but it was as if whatever occurred at night was removed or camouflaged against curious people like us. So what caused the diggings, we wondered. That was an excerpt again from Ellen Crystal's book, Silent Invasion. That was chapter 9. I want to emphasize here that this area, which is near the Hudson Valley, has also been the site of videos showing large UFOs projecting the sounds of jet aircraft. I'll add that I've filmed at night in this area and have caught on video UFOs mimicking planes. The very same phenomena can be seen in many areas in North America. Another interesting case I recently heard when interviewing Kawani Lapsaritis, right here in other news. He's the author of Psychic Bigfoot and Hyperdimensional Bigfoot, is of an eyewitness account of a hunter camped on a mountainside who heard machinery and drilling sounds at night in this remote area. He tried to get closer to investigate, but a Bigfoot was monitoring the perimeter. A Sasquatch was essentially working security for the alien mining operation, keeping pesky humans out of the area. All kinds of different ETs have been coming here for millions and millions of years, and that there's bases, the Sasquatch told me, all over the planet of different races of ETs. Some of them are underground, some of them in, I found two underground cities in dormant volcanoes. Also, another one, a third one I found in this gigantic mesa in Arizona. Now, back in 2009, the late Rosalind Peterson was on the show talking about her research into geoengineering. One thing she mentioned was the potential of climate engineering operations being used to melt permafrost near the Arctic Circle to access minerals and other subterranean treasures. Again, another potential case of mining with unknown aircraft, climate engineering to change the weather and lace the atmosphere with conductive particles, then use EMF to bend the jet stream and heat up the area. You then have your melting of permafrost or ice and access to mining and eventually lay the blame of climate change at the doorstep of regular people. There's a YouTuber from central Alberta who was filming fake planes for many years. YouTube shut him down, but he's been back for a while. And his channel, it's a bit different. His old videos are gone, unfortunately, but he was catching some wild morphing of aircraft trying to hold the shape of a plane, and they were spraying aerosols. I wrote to him when YouTube used to allow for direct messaging because I wanted to have him on the show. This was maybe seven years ago. I recently found his response. I saved it in a document. He writes, At Cold Lake Weapons Range, I used to work for a cement company, and you have to have clearance to go into this area. Home of Operation Maple Flag. Anyway, you can't take photos or video in this area. One time we were waiting on location and a jet flew by making a chemtrail. But this was an F-16 making a chemtrail and this was the first and only sighting what appeared to be a jet fighter making a chemtrail. Also right over my head, complete 360 degree circles of chemtrails were made right over me. The only thing is there was only a shadow going into the trail, no jet, as far as I could see. Regarding geoengineering, if they are spraying heavily, you can pretty much guarantee it will rain once the clouds show up. Also, they will spray coming out of the fronts. I can usually tell if it's going to rain if they are spraying heavily the day before. 
But there are other times, like winter, where there is no reason I could see why they would be spraying. The military involvement is there for sure. There seems to also be complete holograms of fake planes and chemtrails, but who knows what is real or not. Every country in the world knows this is going on, and is the military directly involved in a cover-up? I don't know. It just keeps haunting me what an Air Force guy I talked with 25 years ago told me. He said, if people knew what was going on with UFOs, there would be mass hysteria. He had no reason to lie to me. There seems to be different involvement of different levels. The fake planes that follow me seem to be some type of entity, but the fake planes I've seen have some dark entity shadows around them like fighter jets. Or I always see UFOs flying at these fake planes, standing in a prairie field, and a fake plane flies at you, and then these orbs, like fighter jets, intercept the fake plane, some the size of small cars. This was a shocking sighting as thousands of them cut off this fake plane directly over me. I have photos and video of this. Okay, his name is Rod, and on a related note to his response is similar things I've caught on video, like many skywatchers, a UFO charging at the aircraft, spraying, and then suddenly averting a collision at the last minute. Other interactions include UFOs later flying through the trail that's left behind. Sometimes the sky would be full of these orb-like objects and the aircraft spraying aerosol is flying through the swarm. I don't know who is who. One guess, again, is that there may be native entities that reside in our atmosphere that aren't pleased, to put it lightly, with the release of these chemicals in their habitat. There is no doubt, however, an interaction going on with these aircraft spraying and UFO activity. There's another powerful element here that isn't talked about very much, and that is the aerosol activity being conducted at times to conceal or mask events occurring in the sky that, quote, they don't want you to notice or document. Also, many people online, very observant or psychic people, have posted footage of drifting and consolidating chemtrail fallout, and they point out how it takes on the appearance of perfect right angles or other obvious shapes. The theory is that the large ships, the mother ships, are using the aerosol clouds to conceal their presence. This is often dismissed as pareidolia, but it's quite startling when various image software filtering is used to define angles in unnatural shapes in these clouds. It's another important consideration which adds nicely into this theory of alien involvement with the aerosol operations. As most of you know, some of the films, commercials, and forms of entertainment are used to build a false consensus, to fictionalize true reality. A true reality that's so far-fetched it can't possibly be true. To cement in the false consensus a film is then produced dramatizing that same reality. That film is then programmed into the collective mind, and those who speak about the film's plot as reality can easily be debunked. It's very effective. The example here is the film titled The Arrival, and in it you have a situation where aliens that can take on a human form are causing climate change, specifically warming through a progressive system of terraforming the planet's weather to optimize their existence. Because the aliens can take on human form and blend in with society, they've infiltrated high levels of government and civilian agencies to distract and deflect blame for weather disruptions on the regular citizen. Sound familiar? This film was made in 1996. Independence Day also came out that year, starring Will Smith. This was another alien invasion film that easily eclipsed The Arrival, and The Arrival stayed on the back burner, but seeped into the public subconscious. 
The premise is that the aliens who can mimic humans have already infiltrated high-level positions, networked to buy many old power plants under a company named Plane Corp. Plane, as in spray plane. Anyway, Plane Corp is actually converting the old power plants into terraforming stations to heat up the atmosphere so it will tip into a critical mass feedback loop if that's actually possible. Who knows? Again, this is 1996. The disdain for humans is revealed in many scenes of the film, including the dialogue where the alien, disguised as a JPL chief, says, quote, If you can't tend to your own planet, none of you deserve to live here. There are other films, such as Geostorm, but you get the idea. So based on this cursory rundown of dot connecting, back to the question, is an alien race terraforming the Earth's natural forces under the pretense of an unauthorized geoengineering operation? Your comments are welcome. That's going to do it for In Other News. I'm Jeff Brady. Visit inothernewsradio.com for archives and more information about the guests. Oh.